All right. So as mentioned before, we're excited to have Calvin Shu on stage. Uh, so Calvin, uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to come here and, and talk to the CUGC community. Uh, it's going to be a, an incredible uh, keynote, uh, setting the expectations high for you, man. You always put on a great show. So maybe we'll get a whiskey tip at the end for luck. Oh, maybe. Or there might be, a, there's a little surprise coming here at the end. Awesome, man. Uh, thank you. Thanks for that awesome introduction. And, uh, and Jerry, and you never sound better. Uh, is, <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's fantastic to, to be here again uh, on this virtual one. Um, I've had the chance to attend some in person as well. Uh, by the way, I, I think um, you know one of the things after kind of coming out of hiding um, from last year and all the, the stuff that's been going on, um, you know, if you go to these local meetings and, and you get a ch chance to attend in person, you might just run into a Citrix PM or PMM uh, or engineer celebrity. Um, we've, we've actually been um, really scrambling the jets and getting out there and, and meeting with a lot of folks. And, uh, and so a lot of my team and, and other people on, in the BU um, are participating in these in person. Um, as a matter of fact, as, uh, as I'm here with you virtually, um, I know uh, Tridar, our GM, um, has been doing uh, CUGCs in Bangalore and uh, I think Melbourne, um, you know, maybe doing some uh, other events in, in Japan. So we're, we're, we're all over the place. Um, so great. I, uh, I, what I'm going to do here is I know, you know we've got a, a packed agenda, as I said, um, so incredibly smart, very technical uh, uh, folks that, that will give you a lot of really useful information. Uh, what I wanted to do here today was kind of do part two of what I um, talked about in February. And, um, you know, it, don't worry if you weren't there on the February web webinar or don't remember it. Um, I'll recap a little bit of, of that for you. Um, but, you know, in February, we really established what the new Citrix BU is about. What is our strategy? Um, how are we meeting customers where they are? Um, I, I think, you know, probably the the, the biggest or, or most memorable part of, of that announcement um, and, and that really that coming out party for the new Citrix um, was the refocus on abilities on-prem, um, but also I think more importantly, uh, the focus on hybrid as the, the central focus of what we're trying to do um, in the product team. And, um, and so now, you know, about half a year has gone by. Um, I thought I'd share with you how that strategy has evolved, maybe some tweaks that we've made to it, um, and, uh, and a lot of what I have been hearing from going around and talking to li now literally hundreds of, of customers um, about, uh, about the strategy and what their feedback has been. Um, and I think, you know, if, if there's a takeaway or a way that you can use this information in your own lives as the Citrix champions in your organization, um, it might be maybe there's a few nuggets in here that, that help you explain um, why Citrix is, you know, is still here, is more relevant than ever, um, and uh, building for the future of what EUC needs to be. All right, so with that uh, long preamble, um, let's get into it. I, I think the, the number one thing um, in kind of going around and kind of where I would start with, uh, with a lot of these customer conversations is that the things that have made Citrix historically important and relevant uh, are now even more relevant than ever. Right. None of these things have, have gone away. And in fact, things like you know, empowering a, a hybrid workforce that can work from anywhere. You know, while we started with that 30 years ago, um, it, is, it, it is now more relevant than ever, of course. Even with return to office, I would say, um, you know, the, the, in that scenario, there's still flex time. There's still now this expectation that even if I'm expected to be in the office three, four or five days a week, there are going to be times when I'm not going to be in the office and, and I'm still um, able to work. Right? And, and that actually is even more complex than everyone being remote or everyone being in the office. It, it's the, the transition between those experiences that is, that is so important. Um, I'll show you some data in a little bit that um, device flexibility is more important than ever, uh, and it's not going away. There's no sort of consolidation into one type of device, um, and so uh, you know that, that. And there's a rise of of more mobile um, devices happening. Um, of course, security and compliance uh, are incredibly important, um, and there's this whole talk about zero trust and fitting into zero trust frameworks. I think as the Citrix people um, in, in our organizations, um, sometimes we're overlooked as contributing to that security um, 
uh, aspect, or there's a separate security team that's dealing with, uh, you know, selecting quote unquote zero trust vendors. Um, and uh, you know, I'll talk about what our strategy is um, there and, and maybe um, something that you can use to, to represent um, what you do in your everyday lives as, um, as part of that plan. Um, and certainly, you know, I can go on. There's the, the idea and the need for operational uh, efficiency and being able to um, kind of centralize your app and, and desktop control. Um, and then business initiatives. And I think that was an incredible amount of activity in terms of M&A. Um, and, uh, and certainly we, we saw, you know, although the, I, I did hear a podcast that the, the great resignation is slowing down, if, if not potentially over. Um, but there's still this onboarding and offboarding and, um, and a lot of outsourcing that's going on, right? So um, the initiatives, the use cases, um, the reasons for Citrix are more relevant than ever. And I would also add in here, this is a really interesting piece of data um, yeah, that might be useful to you. The, the, the things that make our businesses work, the Windows applications, um, and I'll say Citrix is not just doing Windows applications anymore, but that has been traditionally how we've been thought of as, as where we um, you know, provide value and, and deliver the apps and desktops. They're not going anywhere. Uh, you, know, you, you look at these numbers um, and, and this data, 35 million different Windows applications, um, some of those commercial, some of those custom, um, and you kind of multiply that across the, all the different types of additions, versions that exist out there of those applications, you get to about 175 million, and then you're trying to deliver those still to uh, what is the dominant endpoint device in enterprise um, uh, with, with Windows 10 devices. Right? That need is is still there, and there's still a ton of relevance. Um, and, uh, and those applications, even though they might get modernized, um, and some of them may move to different web or SaaS uh, providers, um, you know, there, there's no indication that uh, that that these are disappearing. Right. So the the rumors of Windows applications um, demise are, are greatly um, exaggerated. Uh, and so some of that is what feeds into. Um, the, the the discussion that you know if you um, those of you that were on the February webinar maybe remember this was kind of the, the central um, slide or, or descriptor of uh, of the Citrix strategy right we want to be at the center of hybrid uh, and hybrid means so many different things for end user computing um, this is the point that that tends to resonate a lot in my conversations with um, with you guys right and and you each one of you um, you know when I, I've spoken to customers and they pick out a certain element in this uh, this daisy wheel here of uh, what hybrid means um, that is maybe more relevant than others. Um, more often than not, I see every single one of these resonating in some kind of way. Or, um, but let me do a, a quick recap for those that maybe uh, that weren't on the previous webinar. Um, so first off, at the top of the circle, um, hybrid management, right? And this was the big thing was we said, OK, I, we're not going to um, uh, say, um, favor one sort of management plane or another. If you want to use our cloud control plane, fantastic. You know, that's probably the first place you'll see a lot of our innovation. Um, but also, if you want to use it on-prem and use the sort of in a traditional um, CVAD uh, deployment way, uh, we are reinvesting in that as well. Um, and now our goal is really how do we bring the innovation that maybe first appears in cloud, because that's the quickest way for us to deploy it, um, bring it more rapidly on-prem. Um, and then third, what if you want to use both, right? That's going to be a completely legitimate way of deploying and one that we're going to, to support and, and, and actually encourage. So um, whether you use our control plane, you manage it yourself, or you lift and shift it into a cloud and you have that sort of model, and no matter where you want to put the workloads, on-prem cloud, multiple clouds, uh, you know, whatever. Um, so from an infrastructure standpoint, um, we're building towards that, that ideal of, of really any infrastructure, any management plane. Um, hybrid identity is, uh, is an important part of EUC and, and um, so many conversations about um, you know, SAML versus AD versus AAD join versus you know, uh, hybrid join. Um, and we, we really need to account for the different identities that end users bring into this environment. And they're going to have different workspaces than, you know, than in the past. Uh, and by that meaning, there's a combination of their virtual applications, virtual desktops, SaaS applications, local applications, and we need to make all those things work seamlessly together. 
Um, and so, you know, so a lot of this is um, in to the, the deep in our HDX heritage and the things that we build and in order to create seamless experiences. Um, some of this you'll start to, to see in how we deliver the Citrix um, clients, uh, the, the, our, our workspace app and, um, and the experiences that are provided there. Um, but having that kind of single unified way to get to everything in their workspace uh, is, uh, is a huge part of our hybrid vision. Um, as I talked about, devices are, are increasingly diverse. Um, so um, enabling those hybrid device experiences as people move from one to the other or expect to be able to use certain devices um, over others, or as uh, you know, partners are, um, are, are kind of innovating around this idea of mobile thin clients, right? Different form factors than maybe traditionally you thought of as a, as a thin client. Um, you know, those are, are rising in popularity and, and a key part of what we are building towards as well. Um, hybrid networking, I'd say uh, largely um, in as an acknowledgement that we must continue to collaborate with our Netscaler um, colleagues uh, within Cloud Software Group. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, I, at the beginning of the year, I promised that the collaboration would continue. And even though we're in separate BUs, um, you know, we're, we're still very, very important to each other. Um, and, uh, and I'm happy to report that as we've gone through this year and halfway through the year, uh, this has certainly continued to be, be the case. And then of course, hybrid work is, uh, is sort of the, the genesis of all of this, right? So Citrix, um, you know, the strategy to be at the center of hybrid um, for everyone. The, the other thing that has been um, somewhat, I, I, I want to say surprising, but, um, but I have to remind myself that, myself that uh, you know, I live and breathe this every single day. And I, I, I'm you know, aware of the, the many, many different types of features, capabilities, things that we've built out over the last three decades. Um, and sometimes it, it's forgotten, maybe, or um, I'm going to guess that many of you have, um, you know, while maybe you've been the steady Citrix person in your organization, um, you know, maybe there's been some leadership changes that have happened um, above you and, and they're not as familiar with uh, the historical reasons for um, using Citrix and, and all the ways that uh, we've collaborated with our customers to, to bring industry specific capabilities. Um, but but that that's what this mess of a slide kind of represents, right? It, it is uh, it is a bunch of different things. But if you kind of peel it apart and and you kind of um, work from the center out, you think, okay, yes, we're known for the protocol, right? For HGX and for ICA, um, and uh, and that, that that's sort of a, a you know a core piece of what people think of us for. But then you start to expand that and you build out. Well, okay, that that. Um, that protocol needs to be able to reach any type of device, right? And it needs to integrate with lots of different other ISVs and other applications. Um, and um, when and now increasingly, of course, with unified communications, um, we need to support a multitude of operating systems because uh, it is, uh, you know, can tend to be a bit of an, op, uh, an archaeological dig um, when you go through the data center. Um, we were meeting with a customer yesterday, saw the slide and it's like, oh yeah, you know, you need to remove some of those operating systems because they're end of life. Uh, but the reality is that there's still customers out there that are using them, right? And, and so while the support may not be there necessarily, um, you know, it is still part of the, the heritage of why customers continue to, to use us um, because they have something that is out of support but continues to need to be um, delivered and, and on and on and on, right? So it, there is a, a ton of these capabilities that have been built out. Um, over the decades, um, I put in here just a, a smattering of things and kind of bucketize them into to areas of value. Um, but it, it helps me and, and maybe it'll help you in some of your conversations and advocating for what Citrix does in your organization to kind of remind people, hey, yeah, there, there are these capabilities that exist here. And, and even as competitors have um, risen, we continue to develop as well. Um, you know, we, we still hold a, a number of advantages in, in all of these categories. So um, that's sort of technology wise and, and sort of a background and, and more of a historical look. Um, let me shift gears a little bit and kind of talk about where now, um, you know, a lot of these conversations and where our strategy has um, pivoted more towards what the, the future of EUC looks like. And um, you know, hopefully this will resonate with you as, uh, as you know, the things that are happening in your organization. But I, over and over again, kind of three big things keep coming up as 
uh, IT areas or strategic decisions that are affecting EUC. Right? Um, and I put it that way because they're, they're not necessarily EUC decisions. I, I think um, I, I'm guilty of this. I, I'll tend to think of, hey, the world revolves around Citrix and you, know, you make a Citrix choice and then you decide what infrastructure you want to use. Um, but you know, I, I'm, I'm aware the reality is really there's many other workloads. There are other things that are happening in, inside these organizations. And so a, a decision about whether I'm using cloud or data center or both um, is happening at a different level, perhaps, um, than just around EUC. Um, and so what impact does that have on, uh, on you know, our strategy and, and what Citrix can do for you? Similarly, um, you know, particularly through the pandemic, I think endpoint decisions, um, device decisions, um, were made um, irrespective of what the EUC and what the end, the end user experience is like, and certainly what the IT admin experience might be like. Um, so uh, you know, how do we fit in getting applications and or desktops to all of those different types of endpoints? And, uh, and frankly, how do we prevent all these organizations from sliding backwards uh, you know, a, a couple of decades into um, distributed endpoint management where you have no centralized control over um, over a lot of the these core applications that maybe don't run well on endpoints um, or that you just you know want to wrap security and control um, around it um, and it's just very difficult to do that if you're thinking purely in a device-based sort of way um, and then of course security and control which i just mentioned um, and, and all the zero trust initiatives um, you know, those are going on. Those are often part of a separate team outside of the, the Citrix admin group. Um, and, uh, but, and yet they affect what you're doing in EUC. So let me dive into each one of these and, um, and share a few thoughts on how that is uh, impacting our strategy as well as, um, um, you know, what, uh, what I'm hearing customers are trying to make decisions around. Um, so I pulled in some data here. This is a, a chart I created out of um, some IDC forecast information. And um, you can see it, it goes back a few years and goes forward a few years. Um, and we're, we're right kind of smack in the middle of this right now. Uh, this is uh, data around the virtual client computing um, or VDI, DAS, uh, you know, one of the many names for it. Um, it's, a, it's a combination of, of the software piece, which is the dark blue line. Just That's just purely the licensing um, uh, of the, the technology. Um, and then I think more relevantly, the infrastructure that's being used to support specifically VCC. Okay. Um, and uh, first note, you know, great for us. Um, everything is up and to the right. Uh, there is um, certainly no, no slowdown um, being forecasted in terms of what uh, virtual EUC um, technologies are going to do. Um, but really interestingly, I, I think, yes, um, cloud, that middle, uh, I guess, white line um, continues to grow. Um, keep in mind that th these are revenue numbers, right? So uh, the fact that you're renting the cloud infrastructure, it makes sense that there's a sort of nice natural progression um, up and to the right for the revenue growth that's, that's happening there. So there are lo certainly lots of people that are uh, making that cloud decision. Um, but note the bottom line on data center infrastructure. Right, on-prem compute and storage uh, and networking and, and everything that goes along with that, it is increasing as well. Uh, and again, this is revenue number. So think about how it gets monetized typically in a hardware perspective. It's, it's not always the same as, uh, as cloud revenue. Um, so I, to, in my mind, when I look at this, th this really actually shows some fairly significant growth um, in on-prem data center. Some of this is, I've, I've talked to the analyst um, directly about this. Some of this is related to, um, you know, refresh um, and, uh, and coming out of the pandemic. Um, uh, I think an acknowledgement that there, there needs to be growth. I think also a lot of the geopolitical things that are happening around the globe um, and not to mention, you know, everyone's been kind of preparing or, or holding our breath for potential economic impacts, uh, maybe uh, um, recession, um, you know, hopefully uh, those things are are um, are stayed off for a while, but um, but everyone's kind of wanting to be prepared. Um, so actually, data center growth is is coming back in in some kind of way. Um, again, talking to the analysts, I, I think there's, you know, th we had a really interesting discussion about um, about office buildings and with many people either repurposing the way that they use their offices and yet there's tons of great you know fiber infrastructure around it and heating and cooling hvac is, is all set up 
um, that there may be some expectation that some of these empty office buildings are actually converted to data center um, as they uh, as they need more compute on prem and within their control. Anyway, so um, you know a lot about this one slide, but uh, but the, the trend here is really interesting, and I think this is what's impacting how people are thinking about. Okay, um, there's uh, there's cloud, there's data center. Um, how do I know when I do which? And if there's a question that I get more often than not from from my customer conversations, it is uh, it is around what are other people doing that you're you're talking to, and what can I learn from that, and um, you know help me understand what trends you're seeing from your vantage point. And I think the number one thing that comes out is um, that this whole idea of hybrid multi cloud. Um, while you know, at the beginning of the year, I kind of presented it as like, hey, yeah, we want to support you wherever you are. Uh, we want to enable you on prem, whatever you want to do, right? It's a choice. Um, what I'm hearing back really is that more so than ever, it's actually an imperative uh, to be thinking about hybrid multi cloud. Um, and whether they're being driven by their board of directors to have, you know, sort of a multi vendor or multi cloud strategy, um, you know, so that their eggs aren't on, all in one basket or it is, um, it, it is a matter of compliance or operational control that is required. Um, so some things need to stay on-prem and, and be in an on-prem control plane. Um, and I wanna draw that distinction as well between control plane and workloads. Um, you know, those issues come up. Um, and then probably the number one reason that people are looking at this is because of cost. And um, so I wanted to share a, a little bit about um, you know, some modeling that we've done. Uh, we're actually, we're, we're working on some um, papers with, uh, with a, um, you know, doing some actual um, customer case study um, research to understand you know, how this plays out in the real, real world. But just to give you a flavor of what the, the cost story um, looks like, and I think you'll, you'll probably feel this is pretty intuitive, um, but the, the trick is in how to make this actually work. If you were to take a workload, right? right? So let's say the, the squiggly line there represents the fluctuations that happen um, in terms of, uh, of user um, users connecting or sessions connecting. Um, and if you were to move that into all cloud from the workload and infrastructure standpoint, forgetting for the moment about software licenses and applications that you need to put on there and things like that. Um, just from an infrastructure standpoint, right? You have this tremendous flexibility to deal with contractors, DR, M and A, um, but it comes at something of a price, right? It, fantastic flexibility, um, but you, you will pay for it because um, that flexibility uh, has value. Um, so, you know, our models show it's about one hundred thirty-three dollars per user per year for that infrastructure piece. Uh, in sharing this number with a few customers, I've had some say, "Yeah, that's about right." Um, more often than not, I hear that looks really low. Our, our costs are actually quite a bit higher than that. Um, now, on the other hand, if you were to try to deal with this all on-prem, then naturally, as we have done for many, many years, you, you kind of, you know, you plan for a um, an underutilization of that infrastructure. Um, somewhere between 40 and 60% um, is kind of the norm, right? And, and you got to plan for that, that sort of high watermark of a complete DR situation or a global pandemic, for example. Um, and that certainly can reduce costs, right? You, you're, you've got some more costs on the operational side because you got to manage it yourselves. Um, but, uh, but from an infrastructure standpoint, um, you know, you can you can reduce that uh, fairly significantly, but you do have this underutilization and uh, and less sort of that elasticity and flexibility. And you can probably see where I'm going with this now, right? For in the hybrid scenario, you get the best of both worlds. You uh, you know have the ability to burst and manage the, the the sort of dynamic or unpredictable parts of your workloads um, while amortizing and depreciating. Um, data center assets uh, on a more predictable basis for the predictable uh, workloads. And that has you know the effect of, of roughly about being half the cost. Um, I, some saying you know even even less than that kind of depends on where you put that blue line um, in in terms of uh, you know what you want to bet on for your data center purposes. Now, I said this will feel pretty intuitive, but the real trick comes in what makes this possible? Right. And um, I don't believe that having separate solutions for cloud and for on-prem is the way to this path uh, or is the path to this solution. 
Um, so Citrix's approach here is, well, can we provide a unified way, a unified platform for hybrid cloud so that whether you're talking about the control plane being in one place or the other, or the workloads being in one place or the other, you know, all of those capabilities are open to you um, with, uh, with equal support from us. Um, and so, you know, that, that's what we're building for is the, that unified hybrid, not just, um, you know, hybrid meaning multiple side-by-side -side solutions um, being run at the same time. Um, so yes, this, this certainly provides cost optimizations um, as those, uh, you know, previous charts kind of tried to describe. Um, I think the other major business drivers I see are that security and compliance. Um, some things are just much easier to to um, show assurances uh, or operational or compliance um, with uh, when it, when things are on prem um, or they're required to be that way. Uh, for example, um, by governments um, or by uh, regulations uh, that happen in in specific countries. Um, the other one that that comes up quite a bit is the operational control element. Um, the example that I use. Um, is like in retail or insurance, um, you know, this, this, it probably goes in, in many other areas and education maybe, but um, I, let's take the example of, of insurance because uh, that one is, is pretty, um, pretty cut and dry. The, so in, in talking to an insurance or multiple insurance agencies recently, um, you know, the recurring theme there is um, I, I have 12 months of, of work that I have to jam into 10 months out of the year because two of those months is open enrollment and we are locked down from an IT perspective. Uh, really like no changes unless it's a, an absolutely critical security patch go into, goes into that environment. Um, and, um, and for those customers, being in the cloud is, is a really difficult proposition. Um, yes, you can put some workloads in the cloud, but you can't lock down that cloud provider's uh, DevOps, cloud ops team. They're gonna continue rolling out um, changes and fixes. Um, even if you were able to get them to stop, it, it massively increases the risk of turning those changes back on again at the end of that blackout period, right, for IT. So, um, so yeah, uh, just huge logistical reasons why um, people are looking at, uh, at hybrid cloud and having a unified platform to enable that, um, you know, and, and where our value is, is uh, pick, picking up. Um, let me shift gears into the, the second um, strategic area for EUC, um, which is around the, uh, the endpoint devices and, and getting applications to that. Again, uh, I'm going to leverage some data from our, our friends at IDC. Um, this is now the number of devices in use uh, specifically for connecting to a virtual session. Okay, This is not just devices in general. This is specifically for VCC. Um, and I think just, again, visually, you, you get a certain impression, right, um, that there are a couple of uh, significant growth areas here um, in terms of the notebooks or slash laptops um, and smartphone usage. I'll, I'll talk about those two in particular. Um, interestingly, I think um, tablets continue to grow. I, I see a lot of financial institutions, retail, um, some manufacturing, they're making use of a lot of tablets. Um, the analyst feeling was, um, you know, those are certainly trends, um, but not enough to significantly move the, the needle there, um, not as much as the, the smartphone changes. Um, but uh, the, a couple of the, the interesting things were, um, one, the desktops aren't declining as much as I thought they might. Um, they are certainly trending downwards, um, but it's not like a cliff and they're being replaced by notebooks. Uh, maybe in a few more out years, we might see that, that trend happen more and more. Um, as uh, as you know, the depreciation happens on on those desktop devices, um, and thin clients uh, on the bottom row there are flat to very slightly up. Um, they're not going anywhere either. Uh, the thing I should note about this line, however, is when the when the analyst says thin clients, he's specifically talking about um, the the stationary boxes that get velcroed to the back of, of monitors. Um, or uh, or built in into all in ones um, as, as as increasingly happen happening these days, um, the mobile thin clients or the conversion of notebook form factors into thin clients and things like Chromebooks all show up in that top blue line. Okay, so they're participating in helping push um, a lot of that growth in the notebook line is, as in terms of endpoints being used with VCC. So. 
all that taken together, that basically means that the diversity of devices uh, continues to persist um, significantly, at least into sort of the foreseeable um, future, the, the next few years here. And that means the challenge will remain, how do I centrally deliver and manage um, core applications, uh, those 35 million Windows applications that are, that are out there um, to this multitude of use cases and devices. The reason that this is such an important discussion and uh, I'm spending so much time on, on this data um, is that very often in a lot of these conversations I hear, um, hey, we've made a strategic decision that we're going to start deploying more laptops to our end users. And therefore, I need to understand whether Citrix is even relevant in my environment anymore, right? I'm doing everything local. Um, and I would argue, and I have argued, that in fact, the more laptops that go out, the more you need Citrix because you do have those core business application uh, um, that, that reside on, well, Windows, Linux, um, you know, whatever, what you might have um, that need to get out to those endpoints. And now that they're laptops and they're mobile and they're connecting over home Wi-Fi's, the networks are even more unreliable. Um, and all those HDX technologies and um, things that we can do to deal with packet loss and latency and reduce bandwidth um, come more into play. Uh, the peripherals that get, might get applied to that laptop um, continue to be very, very diverse um, and uh, difficult, more difficult to track as uh, those device, those workers are in different locations, right? Um, and so the, the the support for that drives a, a Citrix need. Uh, it's still better than a VPN solution, um, rather than having you know opening up your entire network uh, to to those laptop devices. Um, let's funnel those through some more policy and control and a sort of uh, you know, um, micro VPN and kind of um, smart ways of connecting into specific applications and, and desktops and usages. And then finally, um, you know, as is a, a core part of our strategy in dealing with hybrid workspaces and um, you know, what I didn't talk so much about in February, but has been really an increasingly important part of our, our strategy and, and our um, discussions is that we're offering solutions now for native SaaS and web app delivery with things like secure private access and our um, enterprise browser, right? Um, so we can also deal with some of those local access um, to resources from that notebook um, uh, or laptop. And, and so we're extremely relevant in many different ways there. The other big trending thing was the, the smartphones, right? And um, you know, I again, I talked to the analyst about what was behind some of those trends there in smartphones, um, and uh, and he pointed to a few things. One um, was that you've got a, a whole generation of workers that uh, and and people, um, citizens of the planet, that um, that really don't use anything but their phones anymore. Um, you know, occasionally they'll they'll maybe um, you know, as they're going through school, they'll connect into uh, a, a Chromebook or a laptop, but they, they really live on their phones and, and that is their primary device. Um, those phones are getting bigger, uh, are getting, you know, dual fold screens. Um, the iPhones are getting, um, you know, sort of a USB-C type uh, connector that should make monitor connections, keyboard connections, things like that, um, much more accessible and, and easier. Um, and so those devices, um, along with things like Samsung DeX and Zebra that we support, with a docking station modality, right? Those all can become um, very uh, um, complete computing devices. Um, and those of you that have uh, you know paid attention to what Citrix has been doing for a while, you know we we started this whole vision um, in like 2009 when the uh, the iPhone first came out, and we kind of dubbed it the the Nirvana device or the Nirvana phone, right? It, it kind of gave you all of your computing in your pocket, um, both desktop and and application. So. Um, so I think you know that those are some of the things that are contributing to it, uh, the, to the rise in smartphone usage with VCC, um, and we've been doing a number of things to really enable that um, in recent months, um, including supporting iPad Multi Monitor and Apple Stage Manager support. Um, you know, the hopefully um, you all have been checking out the Global App Config service, uh, which really just helps. Um, configure and set up the, the download, the client um, that you provide to your end users um, with a, a variety of settings, as well as maybe helper applications for unified communications. Um, it's particularly useful in those scenarios where these are not managed devices, right? And a, a lot of mobile devices are, are BYO. 
Um, and, and so there, there's many different things that we've been doing um, for mobile and continue to invest there. Um, and recognizing that trend in mobile devices, um, you know, that, that's, a, again, another reason for even more Citrix to come into play. So similarly with the infrastructure point, I, I would say um, having a unified platform for delivering this hybrid workspace to a variety of endpoints um, is extremely important and is strategic as, um, as even as we're making other decisions about, um, about what types of endpoints you want to provide those end users. Having a unified experience for the end user in terms of single sign-on um, and having a unified experience for admins in terms of having common policies um, for all these different devices, um, being able to meld legacy and modern applications and deliver those to any device uh, is as relevant as ever and, and Citrix is um, you know, as capable as ever in, in that arena. Um, and the third discussion, strategic discussion, is around security um, and control. Um, and uh, this is a phrase that's kind of um, kind of evolved over the, the the first part of this year. And um, you know, as we sat back and thought about um, all these zero trust initiatives that are happening, and talking to some customers and saying, "Hey, help me position Citrix in this zero trust world," because some guy over here is making a bunch of decisions about zero trust and investing in a number of other um, solutions that may or may not play well with what I've got, or maybe a sort of a belts and su suspenders kind of scenario, right? I've got something that is uh, um, with Citrix that is a zero trust solution. Um, and they're asking me to layer on something else that, that's actually just creating more complexity. Um, and then we have these two diverse solutions and, and they're kind of uh, either competing with each other or creating gaps in between each other. Um, just uh, um, you know, creating more complexity than than we need. So, um, you know, I'd say Citrix was zero trust before zero trust. Uh, and um, as I think back to um, you know, Shane very um, politely called out my age and and said I've been here uh, almost twenty years. Um, but uh, you know, when I think back to two thousand four when I joined Citrix, um, and we were branding things like smart access. Um, what was the idea there behind smart access, right? We would collect information about who the user was. We would look at what their device was and, and um, do an endpoint analysis there. We look at what network is it? Was it ours? Was it an untrusted network? What infrastructure applications and data were they touching? Um, and then we'd set some policies around that and then, um, you know, and, and then take an action um, uh, on behalf of the organization to either um, open up access or actions within those applications or dial them down. That's that's zero trust. That, that That's the framework um, pretty much in a nutshell. Um, so, you know, with some people, I, I, I kind of joke, um, you know, we were zero trust before zero trust. We were doing zero trust so long ago that it was called negative trust at that time. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's really um, the idea here is first kind of establish that we're in this framework, that we accomplish a lot of those things. In fact, we've also modernized some of these capabilities instead of being more sort of, uh, you know, if then policy driven, we've got analytics capabilities that are more dynamic and more heuristic um, driven. And the level of automation is um, getting uh, more increasingly, increasingly more sophisticated as well as simple. Um, by enabling, you know, more automated actions to take place. Um, uh, I think about recently, like taking security analytics and combining that with um, session recording and being able to kick off a, a recorded session based on some outlier of user behavior, right? Um, you know, those sorts of things are going to continue to get more intelligent. And we think about how AI can contribute in this area. You know, the options are, are really kind of endless. So. You know, think about what you've already got with virtualization and how that fits into a, a zero trust framework. Um, we are on the cusp of publishing some um, white papers and, and uh, um, things along those lines that, that can help you there. Um, and then start thinking about how might I extend those then to SaaS and web applications, right? Um, think about this as a zero trust application access platform that when applications maybe get modernized and you want to have direct browser access to a SaaS uh, provider, for example, you can still carry over the same types of policies, the same sorts of analytics, uh, visibility, um, the same sorts of orchestration and automation 
Um, the same visibility that you get from the Citrix app or a Citrix client being there, um, you know, knowing what device, what user, what network, right? Um, it's a great place to, to be in, in, in that you can leverage something that is, um, you know, well built into your, uh, your designs and your infrastructure um, and extend it to the newer generation of applications. Um, and when I say, you know, built into your infrastructure, I mean that very literally is that our approach with um, SPA or secure private access, um, and in particular, the, the recently released on-prem version of secure private access, um, it will leverage the same gateway, same storefront, um, you know, the same components, the same you know, policy mechanisms. And as we design an, or sort of redesign and tweak and improve um, the admin consoles for SPA, um, they're becoming more and more integrated in with the DAS and CVAD um, uh, controls. Right. So you can have this kind of single point of control for all application types. You don't have to think about one thing for virtual, another thing for direct um, SaaS applications. Um, and as we, we pursue this strategy and we look at it, you know, there, there are going to be partnerships that are key here. Um, and yes, there will be other items that people want to layer in and the security team may have a, a favorite product of theirs for one thing or the other. Um, but why not start from a platform that has um, you know, been built in and, and well known and, and trusted in your environments? Um, so again, uh, if there's a recurring theme here is um, think about a unified platform to build your zero trust application access on top of um, for, for all these reasons. All right, um, I'm going to close this out with something um, that often I use just for in, internal purposes, but um, I, I wanted to kind of drive um, this point home of, of the unified platform. Um, and maybe this will help you remember it a little bit. Um, and then uh, hopefully there'll be some time for it to, to go through some Q&A. Uh, but in thinking about this, I think, you know, the, the central theme here is that it, it, you know, I started the year saying it's hybrid, 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 hybrid is everything. Um, what I realized that I need to clarify for people also is that um, it, it's the unified hybrid. It's kind of that, that seamless hybrid that is so important um, in this world, right? It, it's not just about disparate pieces coming together and your hybrid um, because of the, you've got stuff in, in different locations and you're using different things. So the analogy I bring here is really, um, it's like if you were to ask Dr. Frankenstein to build you a Labradoodle, right? A, a, an adorable breed of, of dog. Um, he would do something like this. He would take a Labrador and a poodle and he'd chop it up and take different pieces and assemble them in some horrific, monstrous kind of way, right? That's what people are actually kind of doing today in the sense that um, they've got a cloud solution, they've got something on-prem and the two don't really talk to each other um, or they've got a solution for their local applications and SaaS access and something else for their virtual and, and they're, they're not really um, integrating those. And so our approach is really to say, hey, let's seamlessly integrate these things at it, their DNA um, and, uh, and make it so that the, the new thing that you create um, is this adorable Labradoodle, right? Something that you can cherish uh, and value um, and, and grow with uh, over, over the years. And um, so uh, you know, at the risk of being corny, I, I think of Citrix as sort of the Labradoodle of EUC um, in this sense. So that's it. Uh, I, I'm going to beat the dead horse and say, you know, hybrid must be unified. You need a, a unified way to to uh, manage the EUC infrastructure, centrally deliver any application to any device, um, and, and have this kind of common framework for zero trust, um, for security, uh, and for compliance. Um, and uh, you know, we believe that is the, the Citrix platform. Um, and, and that's what we want to help um, both explain to you as well as um, help you explain to your peers, your colleagues, um, uh, maybe your management uh, as well. Um, that th this is a role, um, this is uh, who Citrix is at this point, and, um, and not just that we're looking at the past and saying, hey, we're going to support all these sort of old on-prem kind of things, um, but that there's actually a future that we're looking towards, and that future aligns with a lot of the big decisions that customers are making around infrastructure, endpoint devices, um, and zero trust. So with that, I'll say thank you. I'll close out um, my portion of the uh, of the the day sessions and uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions if there's some uh, anyone wants to help me see what's come in along the way uh, 
Um, I do see one here. All right. Hey, Calvin, thank you so much for the uh, for the presentation there, man. Well, uh, like I said, we'll take some take some questions here. There are a couple. Um, so we'll look at, uh, let's see, the first one. Uh, where is it? Let me scroll up here. I just saw where to go. Oh, th thoughts on hearing. Uh, uh, where is it? Yeah. Uh, th uh, uh, where is it? Uh, thoughts. Have you been hearing less VDI and DAS replacing it everywhere? So basically, you know, hearing less VDI and, and more DAS, just kind of thoughts on that. Um, really? No, <laughs> I, I think um, it, it's been. Um, well, I, I mean, think about the, the position I'm in and, and when I'm going in and sharing the, the, the current Citrix strategy with customers. Um, there's a fair amount of um, I get a lot of right. Like, it, thank you for continuing to support my VDI. Um, this is uh, this is what I, I needed. Uh, um, you know, maybe I, I'll use DAS at some point, but I, I don't know. So um, so there's kind of a, a steady state of a, a lot of, of that going on. Um, I'd say, um, you know, there, there's certainly an increasing trend in, in DAS um, in that um, we're, we continue to see the, the volumes of usage and, and you know, sessions launch from our control plane grow at an exponential rate. Um, but um, more often than not, I guess I'm, I'm not seeing a sort of displacement, if that's the, the question, um, is what it looks like. It's more of a, okay, now I understand, um, you know, and you know, I'm thinking about these much like I think about hybrid cloud. I'm, I'm thinking about these as different use cases. I have a reason to do VDI on-prem. I have a reason to do DAS. Um, a lot of times that may be, hey, DAS is appropriate for my M&A scenarios and my contractors, um, but for my internal employees or maybe people that are creating significant IP for the organization, VDI is still my solution, right? Um, and uh, and so that's, that's a challenging thing to do, um, but I think it's one that uh, Citrix is really uniquely positioned to, to help with. Yep, and that's actually an interesting uh, a transition. A second question that came in uh, just this is from DJ. He said that uh, I think Citrix needs to rebrand. Can't believe I'm saying or suggesting this to HDAS, <laughs> Hybrid Delivery as a Service. We do the same thing, just isn't true as DAS just sends the wrong signal. So that was just a comment there. I'm curious what your thoughts are. That I, I'm going to mark this day down in my calendar as the first time anyone has asked us to rebrand <laughs> something. Um, you know, I, and yeah, I think you know there there is some simplification of brand. I'm going to forecast a little bit that I, I think we we do want to do, um, but we're we're going to make it a. Uh, um, you know, easy on you guys and and uh, and you know, give you plenty of warning um, when that happens. Uh, but thank you for that suggestion. I, I think there there is something there, right? That it, we 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 do need um, at times to kind of remind people that um, Citrix is uh, kind of continue to progress. We keep building, we keep innovating, and, and there's new stuff around the corner. Awesome. So last question, I guess uh, we'll take it. So does Citrix have any documentation or presentations specifics around Citrix being zero trust that we can share with our management and investors? It can be fairly technical documentation. Doesn't need to be watered down. All right. Yeah, uh, we are reviewing um, a very nice white paper um, at, as uh, as we speak. Um, so so yes, uh, and then it's accompanied by uh, presentation as well. I think the presentation is kind of more consultative, but but certainly um, I think the white paper is going to help a lot in that in that area. And I'm really excited to get that out. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. And, and thank you for, for sharing your, your keynote and presentation. It's always interesting to kind of take a step back from the technical world, look at everything at a really high level. And you did a great job at doing that and, and uh, allowing it to kind of map back to how Citrix is, is playing in uh, with those trends. So thank you. Yeah, I never claim to be technical. You're going to get plenty of great technical content. <laughs> here, no, so. it's cool. And you always uh, are switching up uh, the vision. And it, it's cool to, uh, have to see that and, and how it's positioned. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, everybody. All right. So